My name is Alan Padgett. I teach systematic theology here at Luther Seminary. And it's my privilege also to serve on the OS committee uh, and to welcome again our speaker for this year, Dr. Bob Cole. Um, the members of the committee also asked me to announce that next year's speaker will be Gregory Boyd. Uh, and the exact titles have not yet been worked out, but you're welcome to come to that as well, should the Lord tarry. <clears throat> as uh, was announced last time by my colleague Gracia, the lectureship is named in honor of a beloved professor here of many years, George Oss, um, a long, not only a longtime member of the Luther Seminary faculty, but someone who is passionate about evangelism and about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're very happy again to have as our speaker today Dr. Robert Kolb. Dr. Kolb is the Mission Professor of Systematic Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, where he also directs the Institute for Mission Studies. He's probably best known to our students as the co-editor and translator of the Book of Concord. Although he's made significant contributions to the study of Martin Luther and the Lutheran theological tradition, both his own works, edited works, and translations. He has, for example, a completely objective and neutral book on Martin Luther with the title Martin Luther, Teacher, Prophet, and Hero. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kolb again. As I just, as I just told um, Alan, I'm, I'm a historian in the tradition of Leopold von Ranke, and I just tell it like it is. <laughs> um, yesterday I appeared as a church historian. Today I'm going to appear as, I suppose, a church historian too, um, but with a little different uh, angle. I want to uh, talk about the theology of Martin Luther as a resource for personal witnessing in our day. Now, I, I recognize that, that Luther's theology gives us resources for other kinds of of, or other aspects of uh, the mission on which our Lord sends us. Uh, but I want to focus today on what I've been able to focus uh, on a little bit more in, in my own teaching um, and in witness workshops that I do for congregations on, on the angle of personal evangelism. Uh, because at least in our church body, we, we talk a lot about evangelism, but I don't know that we have provided uh, in recent years adequate helps for our people. And I think we have been tempted uh, to um, go shopping in other places, and I think that's, that's good, that's important for Christians to do. But I believe that in the Lutheran tradition there are certain, there are certain aspects, certain uh, principles, certain staples that uh, provide us with resources that are particularly apt uh, for the world in which we live, at least in North America in the 21st century. Um, I'm going to move rather freely uh, through my manuscript, but uh, Pat Kiefert uh, read the paper and, and uh, made a comment on the first sentence, and if Pat makes a comment on something I do, I, I pay attention. I, I would advise you all, to, no, never mind. Um, so I didn't think this was all that profound, but he pointed out that it really is something important for us. Martin Luther stood at a point in which church, it, it stood at a point in church history at which he was called to translate the biblical message anew into a different cultural situation than its longtime Mediterranean idiom. I didn't think that was all that important, but in our conversations last week here on missional education, um, he um, made it clear to me how important this, this concept of us as translators of the biblical message really is. And Luther did practice translating the biblical message into the world in which he lived. As I said yesterday, he didn't meet very many unbaptized people in his entire life. 
But he did meet people whom he thought were, were uh, trapped in a form of Christianity that didn't really do justice to the biblical message and didn't do justice to the needs of the people of his day. And so he spent his life about the work of translating. Now, he was translating uh, the message of Jesus Christ uh, for people who lived at a different time and a different place than we do. And so I think one of the tasks of the church historian is not to try and write prescriptions out of, for instance, in this case, our own tradition. But church historians are designed to help us understand why and how uh, the, the people of other generations did what they did with the biblical message in their contexts so that we get some cues and clues to how we might do that in our own. And I think that, that Luther uh, does have some insights that recall us to things that we kind of know. I don't think I'm going to say anything that's terribly original today, um, but that Luther recalls us to some of those insights and by trying to place him in the context of, of this particular topic, this particular concern, I think maybe we can get uh, some some helpful uh, resources for our own attempts to give witness to our faith. Uh, as I said, we could, we could talk about Luther's uh, insights for uh, the mission of the church in many regards, but, but today we'll look at our personal witness. So I've tried to frame some questions that can guide us through some points that I think we ought to think about. The first overarching question <clears throat> that I'd like to work on answering today with you um, might be something like this. What's a person to do to say when we encounter someone who is living apart from Christ? And the first, the first question that we might try to answer under that is, who cares? The who is the center of the question, I think. And so the first point that Luther makes for us is, again to repeat from yesterday, Luther's concept of God as really not a concept at all, not an abstraction, but a very concrete person. The intensely personal view of God that Luther had explains a, a great deal about, about everything we read from his pen. But he he encountered God as not just a bigger human being, but as the divine person, but the person who uh, created the heavens and the earth, me together with all creatures. Now, I just kind of grew up and spent, spent most of my life presuming that everybody thinks that there is a, a personal God, a creator, and that what we have to do in our witness is to get the idea across that Jesus Christ reveals that personal creator. But it just isn't so anymore. We encounter more and more people who share conceptions of the ultimate and the absolute, maybe without even calling it divine, um, that are quite different. Uh, Ernst Trelch said a hundred years ago that there were basically two religions in the world. Oh yeah, and then there was a third. Uh, one of them was the creator god religions, uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Then uh, there were religions like Buddhism or I suppose ancient Gnosticism that conceive of ultimate reality of the absolute as a unitary, impersonal spirit that radiates some kind of power uh, throughout the world and in ancient Gnostic form uh, hooks up with the spark that got cruelly separated from the, the one uh, and trapped in my body and I will uh, lose my individuality and materiality and be reunited to the one and, and that then everything will be, um, as the Germans say, cool. Then Trelch sort of dismissively said there are other people who still think, silly people, that um, 
that divine power or ultimate power is dispersed. He called them animists. One of my doctoral students says you can't use animist because it's a Western European North American imperialist term that imposes on the traditional religions of the world um, uh, a unitary scheme that they don't have. But, but at least there's something out there that, that divides power up. Um, it's perhaps more easily tameable. I'm not sure that's the motivation for everybody. Um, but, but what Trelch dismissed, we see coming back time and time again in, in the world religions and in, in actually secularized people uh, as, as an explanation of ultimate reality. And Trelch missed the fact that there are in our day also human beings who think that human beings are the ultimate and absolute. Sometimes as a group, a party, a race, a social class, um, sometimes people are so silly as to think that the individual can actually be the ultimate and absolute. And so I think it's important that we take our cue from Luther and remind ourselves constantly that we have at the very basis of our witness with many of our contemporary North Americans the task of I don't think you can convince them, I think you simply have to witness to them that God is a person and he is a person who cares. He is a person also who speaks. Speaking is somehow bound up with personhood and our God is a God of conversation. Luther's lectures on Genesis uh, take him uh, back over 20, 20 years of theological development in some ways. And there he emphasizes particularly how important the speaking of God is. Actually, I think it was Professor Kiefert who once said, um, you know, the medievals said that um, God is pure act. And Luther defined which act that was. It was talking. Um, in 1535, he wrote the words, let there be light are words of God. This means that they are realities. For God calls into existence the things that do not exist. He doesn't speak grammatical words. He speaks true and substantial realities. Accordingly, that which among us has the sound of a word is reality with God. Uh, a couple years earlier, on lecturing on Psalm 2, he had said that God communicates through a verbum reale, a word of reality, that is not just a sound as our words are. His language is different from ours. When the sun rises, when the sun sets, God is speaking. When fruit on the trees grow in size, when human beings are born, God is speaking. The words of God are not empty air, but things very great and wonderful, which we see with our eyes and feel with our hands, and of course also hear with our ears. So Luther believed that when God says, let there be, things happen. In a sinful world, with our, our sinful shield of protection, we don't always recognize that. But he also then went on in his 1530, the lectures after 1535, uh, to comment on 2 Corinthians 4, 6, <clears throat> where Paul calls us new creatures. He says that our our conversion or our new birth is a new creation brought about by the Word of God this time in grammatical form but a word of promise that works a new work of creation and God doesn't just talk into thin air he talks with he is in conversation with us his human creatures he created us, Luther points out, to be in community first of all with him and then also with one another. He creates us for community with himself and with each other. Now, this isn't the way Luther said it, but I think we always have to remember God's first great whoops. Do you remember the first time God said whoops? Well, he was saying, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, and all of a sudden he said, it's not good. 
that that Adam guy be alone. And so community, both with God but also with one another, is part and parcel of our humanity. And that God who created us for conversation and community <clears throat> is a God who cares. He cared enough, if I may steal a line from Hallmark cards back in the days of my youth, he cared enough to send his very best. Uh, his best came and came to the cross where Luther saw the essence of God and redefined the word righteousness of God. It is indeed a gift that he gives to us, but his righteousness in and of himself, being the kind of person God really is supposed to be, Luther defined through his theology of the cross as the one who has mercy, who exhibits indeed his wrath, but in the envelope, in the cloak of his mercy. That's who God is at his heart. And in addition then, God's people care. I'm going to repeat words that I cited from Luther's 1523 sermon on, on 1 Peter 2.9. Everything then should be directed in such a way that you recognize what God has done for you. And you thereafter make it your highest pri priority to proclaim this publicly and call everyone to the light into which you have been called. Where you see people that don't know this, you should instruct them and also teach them how you learned. That is, how a person through the good work and might of God is saved and comes from darkness into light. As we talked a little bit about yesterday, uh, I think Luther's anthropology, his understanding of what it means to be human, has this rather strange idea that we live not in one dimension but in two, that our righteousness at its core is dependent on, on the first commandment, as our Lord said in, in Matthew 22, it's all about fearing, loving, and trusting in God above all things. That's the heart of our righteousness. And as I'll say a little bit later, trusting is not something we can just muster up ourselves. It's got to be a gift. It's got to be created and called forth out of us. And out of that righteousness that is God's gift, his gift of new birth, his gift of a new identity, flows our performance of God's expectations for us. They called it passive righteousness and active righteousness. But to make that distinction, I think, is a very, very helpful um, anthropological premise for our witness. For we recognize the difference between God's reality as he pronounces and proclaims our new identity upon us from our, in the mystery of the continuation of sin and evil in the lives of the baptized, <clears throat> from our failure always to behave like the children <clears throat> excuse me, he wants us uh, to be. So our first priority, I think our first priority, not necessarily chronologically the first thing we think about, but our first priority is to cultivate that relationship of trust in the person of our God as he has revealed himself in Jesus of Nazareth. On the other hand, <clears throat> this is a line I love to use, uh, I love to trap students, I think there's a certain pedagogical, pedagogical something or other. Um, yeah, Rhonda Ray can laugh because she doesn't have me anymore, but... Uh, <laughs> um, Luther was very strong in the Department of Works Righteousness. He believed very strongly that we are righteous by our works. Uh, not just at the beginning of his life, at the end of his life too. It's just that he restricted the righteousness of our active performance of God's expectations to what we might call the horizontal realm. But he took the penultimate performance of God's will very seriously. He just said it was, well, his term was detrimental to salvation. He said it's detrimental when you try and offer your performance to God as the basis of your own worthiness. God gives you your worthiness, and only God gives you your worthiness. 
And it is only out of that perception of worthiness that you can proceed to live the life God wants you to live. And if you don't keep those two things straight, Luther said, you're in big trouble. Well, I think it's very helpful to do that as we give witness to our faith. Um, because we take seriously the penultimate needs of our neighbor, and we recognize that we need to meet them too, and that it is in, in the horizontal sphere of our lives that we may, may teach people, build people's ability to trust, so that they can respond as God wills to the gospel. This is a witness we make for life here and now and for life eternal. Uh, I still come back every once in a while to the, uh, the anthropologist Ernest Becker's work on the role of death in American society. It's, gosh, it's got to be 40 years old now or so. But we're still, in this culture, bent on denying the reality of death, hiding from the reality of death. But we all know that you can run, but you finally can't hide. And so as we think about the evangelistic task, we have to do what Luther, as a medieval person, just naturally did. He thought a lot about death and dying and heaven. And he proclaimed that message of hope and comfort um, fairly often. But, as a matter of fact, Luther knew that for people in his day, as, even if not to the extent that it's true for people in our day, heaven can wait. Jean Paul Sartre had it right. Um, we, we really are surprised when death stares us in the face. But Luther was deeply eschatological. But his understanding of the end times and end things didn't have to wait. It invaded his life this very day. He recognized he was standing in the presence of God. And he recognized that the eschatological result of his sin today is that the shalom, the peace, the joy, the order that God wants to give his human creatures was broken, disturbed, sometimes destroyed. And so the eschatological thrust of Luther's thought reminds us that whether they want to talk to us about heaven or not, our neighbors have a need, and a need to be encountered by the living God who wants to deliver that shalom that he made for us in the first place. Yeah, but why would anybody be interested in our message anyway? Luther helps us answer that question, I think, extremely well. If we look behind some of our impressions of him uh, a little bit more deeply. Um, Luther dared to change the order of traditional catechetical instruction. Uh, there were a couple of varieties, actually, but none of them placed the Ten Commandments first. But he said in 1522, you have to diagnose the illness before anybody's going to be interested in a cure. So he constructed the Ten Commandments to call us to repentance. So Luther's clues about how to do the diagnosis that helps people when they don't already feel the crushing power of the law, the terrifying power of the law on their backs. Uh, Luther helps us do the diagnosis. And there are two points that I think we ought to note. One is that he, he analyzes, as we've already said, the heart of the problem, that we don't fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So his definition of a God whatever God, true God or false God, in the, in the large catechism and the explanation of the first commandment is really a very helpful evangelistic tip. What's really at stake here 
is that people have to trust. They are just hardwired to trust. Talk more about trust a little bit later. They're hardwired to trust in someone or something as the ultimate source, the absolute source of all good and the safe place of refuge in every distress. Now, most of us have more than one God because no single substitute that we fashion in our own image or in something else's image, no single substitute for Yahweh suffices. And I say that uh, we, in the mystery of the continuation of sin and evil in the lives of the baptized, you and I also are fighting the battle against our own polytheism day in and day out. That's why our whole lives are lives of repentance. Um, I've, I've played around with Luther's, we got to trust in something as the source of all good and the refuge in the time of need. And uh, one of my favorite dogmaticians is Eric Erickson. He'd probably be terrified or angry if he knew I called him a dogmatician. Uh, but he laid down some fundamental dogma for our culture. Um, and his stress on personal identity, I think, is a great evangelistic help. And I understand identity in Erickson's system as something close to Luther's understanding of righteousness. It's what I am at my core. It's the person I'm supposed to be, that I want to be. Um, and my fouled up identity is just that. It fouls me up. Um, so we need to be thinking as we listen to people of where they're placing their sense of identity, the source of their identity, where they're getting the source of their safety or security, what the source is of their personal dignity, of their meaning, their worth in life. When those things come together, we experience shalom. When they're not together, and they can only be together when they are brought together by our Creator, uh, then we're in big trouble. And Luther points out that we can, we, in the small cult articles, we can figure out that something's wrong. It's not hard to recognize other people's sin particularly. Maybe our own's a little more difficult. But he says it takes the revelation of Scripture. You have to know about the person of God and who he is in Jesus Christ before you can recognize the depths of that, that thing that the <clears throat> church has called original sin. Which, of course, Luther says is not a thing. <clears throat> it's a broken relationship. It's not fearing, loving, and trusting in God above all things. And so we need to be listening to other people to see how they're talking about their sources for identity, security, and meaning. Where they are placing their ultimate trust before we can effectively bring the gospel's alternative to them. And we may not be able to trust their own self-analysis because as children of our father the deceiver we lack the ability by fallen nature to be honest with ourselves and so in all patience and all careful listening Christians have to join those to whom they are witnessing in the trenches the other thing that Luther tells us, and this is maybe even more of a surprise to us, the other thing that Luther tells us is that evil comes in a variety of forms. Most of us think that evil comes basically in the form, for Luther, of guilt, maybe shame, but basically guilt. It's that I have broken God's commands, I have broken my relationship with him, and so I better feel guilty, and if I feel guilty enough, then the gospel will make sense. Well, that's not really what Luther said at all. He recognized that evil comes in many forms. And in the Ten Commandments, he explained them all as a failure to fear and love God at their very base, all our disobedience. The problem is that we've broken our relationship with him, and we can learn that 
through illness and death, through job loss and financial crisis, through anything that shakes our system of establishing identity, security, and meaning. Anything that points out there are cracks in our God. Or gods. And so, Luther tells us, in the small called articles again, that the law of God is not just an accusing finger. He didn't disagree with that. The problem is, most of our North American fellow citizens don't, don't look at the a pointing finger. They don't listen to the accusing voice of the law. And so the dilemma is, do we have to wait until they finally wake up and feel guilty <clears throat> to begin witnessing to our Lord. And Luther's answer is no, because the law, according to the small called articles, according to Jeremiah 23, comes as a hammer that smashes us to smithereens. Or sometimes taps a little more gently, but puts cracks in our old system of holding life together. And one of my students once, um, well, I was trying to, to look smart so I went home, and, and our students don't know much Latin anymore. So I figured I could whisk one by them. Looked in the Vulgate in Jeremiah 23, and I came back and ins told them, instead of saying, lex semper accusat, the law always accuses, they should say, lex semper conterit. And I was standing there very proud knowing that my students were saying, wow, is he smart? And C.J. Armstrong raises his hand and says, is that with one R or two? <laughs> and I had to say, C.J., I, I don't even remember if it's the right word. <laughs> and he s said, it's the right word, all right. And I said, well, if it's got one R, what does it mean? And he said, well, it's third conjugation to smash to smithereens. And I... Um, said that's, that's what it means in Jeremiah 23, it's the hammer and the rock. But what if it had two R's? Well, then it's second conjugation, he said. And I won't say exactly what he said, but he said it would terrify you um, extremely. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's right too. So what we have to look for are the cracks in people's old system of holding life together. Their religio. I know that's the false derivation from Latin, but, but the false derivation is better than the, than the correct one. Rel religio is that which holds life together. But it also scares us. It may not terrify us in the way CJ was thinking of, but it, it, it scares us. It puts us on edge. And when those little cracks, when those little fears are present in someone's life, we can move in with the beginning of the gospel. The beginning of the gospel will, as Luther says, help people understand that there is a God there who loves them, and that will free them up to be even more honest with themselves than they've been able to be before. And then we will be able to come with the gospel. And the gospel is, for Luther, the forgiveness of sins. My next question is, what's God done about this evil? How's he solved the problem? And as a corrective to Gustav Aulain's stress, necessary stress, on Christus Victor as the explanation for, for Luther's looking at the atonement, Jan Siggins, uh, the Australian, New Zealand-born Luther scholar, probably has a better answer. Luther doesn't have an atonement theory if by atonement theory you mean an explanation that gets on top of how God has saved us. But Luther does have dozens and dozens and dozens of ways of talking about the atonement that embrace both Christus Victor and vicarious satisfaction and a host of other metaphors and descriptions and, and pictures and the like. And if you look at the large catechism, you can see that there the talk is not so much about his forgiveness of sins, as important as that was for Luther, 
but it's about his liberation. It's about his coming into the prisons into which Satan, uh, the world, and our own sinful desires have put us. It's about liberation. And in other passages, it's about reconciliation. It's about death and new life. Uh, I think you could argue, as Jonathan Trigg does in his book on uh, Luther on baptism, that Luther's favorite way of talking about justification, about the restoration of righteousness, is in what Werner Ehlert and others have reminded us, to justify means to do justice to. God does justice to us sinners in our baptism, in absolution, in the proclamation of his word. When he says to us, you're dead as a sinner, and I am giving you a new identity. And that goes on day after day after day in our lives. The old creature in us with all sins and evil desires is to be drowned and die through daily contrition and repentance. And on the other hand, a new person is to come forth and rise up to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. What that means is that Luther gives us more resources for for expressing the gospel in those initial conversations than we will ever be able to use. Well, Luther, the Holy Spirit in Scripture, actually, because Luther's just trying to pass on what he finds there. But what that means, what that motif means, is that when our fellow Americans say to us, as sometimes they do, and, and sometimes they don't mean it, but sometimes they really mean it, when they say, I wish I were dead. We don't have to say, oh no, cheer up, it'll be all right. We can say, do I have a deal for you? Because we can give them the gift of baptismal death, which frees them from their old identity and gives them a new identity as children of God through the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And Luther says that the word of God, which creates reality, comes to pronounce us righteous, to bespeak us righteous. When Luther was just sort of talking meat and potatoes, here's who you really are, he used this baptismal death and resurrection theme. When people were particularly weighed down by sin, he grabbed a word that, so far as I can tell at this point, and I'd be glad to be contradicted on this if any of you have looked at the medieval sources more closely than I, which wouldn't be hard to have done. Um, but I think he grabs this word imputare, to impute, um, that wasn't all that much used as far as I can tell. But it's a word that talks about the regard God has for us, how he sees us, what he says we are. And so as, as, as Gerhard Ferdi wrote, in one of the many lines that I steal from him continually, the more forensic our understanding of justification is, the more real our justification is. Because God's word determines reality. And so we can come to, to announce to people in our evangelism and to repeat to them again and again that reality no matter how we perceive it, and it's real when we perceive our sinfulness, that's this mystery of the continuation of sin and evil in the lives of the baptized. But God comes to change the reality through a word, through the word of our baptisms, through the word of absolution, through the word that was given to us at this altar, through the word of the mutual conversation of Christians one with another. Well, why does God speak to us in that way? Because he wants to give us life, and he wants to give it to us more abundantly. John wrote these things so that we may know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Deliverer, and that we might have life in his name. Believing, trusting, we may have life in his name. If trust is at the center of our identity, if trusting in Yahweh determines who we are at our core, then we speak to cultivate trust. Wilfred Herle, about 
seven, eight years ago in, a, in a, an address that some of us, I think, probably heard at the International Luther Congress. Um, talked about Luther's understanding of justification as the reestablishment of the Old Testament concept of communal faithfulness. Herle, who is a systematician um, at Heidelberg, talked about Gemeinschaftstreue, communal faithfulness, as belonging to the very essence of God. Luther says there's no God apart from the revealed God, and there's no revealed God apart from his relationship with us, and there's no being completely and fully human, fully enjoying our humanity, without fearing, loving, and trusting in him above all things. And so Luther said that though we can't create trust, I can't force you to trust me, I don't think you can even force yourself to trust me. Even a psychologist like Eric Erickson talks about trust but can't really define how to do it, how to make it happen. It simply is there when God comes to us in Jesus Christ and says, I love you. I'm dying to love you. I have risen to give you new life. And the Spirit does something with it. We don't know what exactly the Spirit does with it, but God has created us as psychological beings. And Wittenberg was a place where they didn't just teach theology, you know. They made important advances in astronomy and botany, the teaching of history, there was a school of Latin poets that came out of Melanchthon's and Luther's circle. And they also specialized in rhetoric and dialectic. They talked about how you communicate. Luther was a first article person as well as a second and third article person. And Lutherans aren't scared of technology, as I said yesterday, but they aren't scared of the academic disciplines. They're critical. They recognize that a lot of modern dogma does come clothed in psychology and sociology and anthropology, and you've got to sort that all out. But they recognize the academic disciplines as good gifts of God and good tools to be used in the service of our witness to the gospel. Well, I want to give you some time to have at me. Um, well, I got one, one quote that I've skipped over here that I really am going to get in. Just, this is what trust is all about. Trust is nothing else than believing what God promises and reveals. God's word and our faith are both necessary. Without the word, there's no faith. And so Luther told his students that we have to imagine God saying to us, Darling baby, my dear little mouse... Now, I, that's not something that North American parents say to their kids, but, but trust me, Germans still say, oh, you dear little mouse, um, to their spouses and children. And, and, and so it, it's, it's got a force that's a little hard. But faith lives from the word, and faith perceives the profoundly paternal love and the thoroughly maternal caresses of this God who will not stop loving us who will, as we read in 2 Timothy 2, be faithful even when we are faithless because he cannot deny himself because that is the essence of his godness that he reveals on the cross even if it comes in a weak and foolish word. Well, our time really is up. There's so much more that that we could say, there's one other point I want to make, a point that a student made to me. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the means of grace and how they cultivate trust in the promise. But my, my framework for thinking about evangelism comes from Fort Dodge back in the, in the Eisenhower era when all things were good, uh, at least for European-derived North Americans. Evangelism in those days was uh, basically telling about the sacraments, <laughs> oh, the sacraments, well, uh, to the uh, Baptist and Methodist spouses that we had converted um, through, through marriage, yeah. 
And so I've, I've never completely lost my being a little bit embarrassed in evangelism, at least, about the sacraments. And one of my students just blew me away a year ago when he came and said, uh, we were doing an evangelism class together, and he said, you know, um, the sacraments are really the, the most effective way of, of beginning the evangelistic conversation, I suppose. And I said, no, you're wrong. And he replied, no, you're wrong. Because my generation doesn't have any problem with God's using media of his choice, different media, coming at us, bombarding us from all directions. No, the sacraments actualize and materialize, concretize this promise of new life this promise of God's sustaining love in a way that can come into the evangelistic conversation very, very early. Well, I said, hmm. And I'm still saying, hmm. Uh, but I, that's a little bit of food for thought that, that I wanted to get in before I end. Luther doesn't give you a program for evangelism. Luther doesn't give you the final answers on how to, to be evangelistic. But I think if we plumb our own tradition as Lutherans, we will find resources that can serve us in our ecumenical conversations that will enrich the whole household of faith for bringing the word of the Lord, the word of life, to those people to whom the Lord sends us as we fulfill his command, well, as we simply can't resist the dynamic of the word of the Lord that has given us new life, that has made us born anew, and that just automatically, by nature, sends us with the message of our risen Savior. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I look forward to some questions in the next 10 minutes. Sorry, I took so long. Any comments, questions, complaints? Yes? Your lecture is uh, within the structure of a, maybe a controversy between the confessional versus the missional church. When the missional church, uh, people speak of the missional church, they speak uh, typically about the, uh, uh, the kingdom of God work. And the kingdom of God work, uh, I'll look at John Bright, seems to speak of both things, issues of justice as well as proclamation or evangelism of the church as being the same thing and seems to make a terrible muddle of the law and gospel. Mm. First use of the law particularly, and second use of the law as well, and the proclamation. What does that do to this whole missional thing and how can confession be missional theology at that point? Well, I, there I think Luther is particularly helpful because he's got what I usually try to illustrate like this. Um, he's got his two realms, his uh, passive righteousness and active righteousness, his distinction of law and gospel. And, and they're not the same. Those three actually interact. There's, there's the law that says you better trust in the vertical realm um, that is a matter of active righteousness, actually, in our response to the passive righteousness that God gives. So the, the three uh, interact. But I think it's very helpful. I think also um, Bonhoeffer's phrases of, that we translate uh, ultimate and penultimate uh, help us straighten things out. Penultimate in Latin means almost ultimate. Now not all penultimate concerns are almost ultimate. They are second, but second's better than 17th. And we need to recognize that um, we can't enjoy our new birth and our new life in Christ without being concerned for justice in this world. And, and Luther gets a bad rap there. He, again, his eschatology, I suppose, is at fault. Um, uh, he was only concerned about the afterlife. Well, no, he wasn't. And my goodness, the things that he said to his own prince, sometimes a little more subtly when he criticized drinking, um, that was a sore point with John Friedrich, um, but uh, sometimes very directly addressing city councils and, and princes uh, with the word of the Lord not only about 
persecuting um, uh, believers who, who were part of the Lutheran Reformation movement, but also just abusing peasants, whatever. And so it seems to me that, that we can honor those kinds of concerns, um, but because we have this very, very intensely personal understanding of God, as I was talking yesterday with, were you here yesterday? I talked with Mary Larson there, or whatever her name was. Um, oh, Gracia Grindel, I always get, get her name mixed up. Um, God's very personal, and he wants to be known as Jesus Christ. And, um, and so we bring that dimension. Uh, and I think that's, that's a way in which we can enrich the, uh, the very necessary conversation of the whole church. And I must say that in your larger family, I shouldn't say this, but in your larger family of your confession, there are denominations that have taken their ecumenical responsibility more seriously, and there are those that have taken it less, response, uh, less seriously. And um, we all need to repent. Any other questions or comments? Um, with respect, um, with um, meekness, or however you want to translate First Peter 3. But a genuine concern for them, if we really believe uh, what the word of the Lord says, I think, um, then our respect and love for them is going to drive us to um, make that witness. And I was, we were talking yesterday about one of the really tricky things I think that, uh, that I haven't figured out at least is how we do honest interreligious dialogue that is truly respectful, but that is respectful enough to say we believe that there is only one name given among human creatures by which we may enjoy our humanity fully. So while we want to listen to you and we want to hear your concerns, we can't help but testify. And um, I think that's something that, that the representatives of Islam, for instance, that I know, that I've read about, um, encountered in one way or another, that's something they don't hesitate to say. Um, and I see absolutely no reason why we should be shy about it. But it's, a, it's, kind, of an ex, it's kind of an exciting challenge, I think. Um, I treasure the, the Eisenhower years. I mean, it was so good to live in, in the shelter. Um, but there's something, there's something exciting about the wind blowing in your face, too. And the ice pellets coming at you. Mm-hmm. I think so, uh, because he is this real person, and we have stories about him. We can we can introduce him as a real personality. I think probably that um, I don't know, but I think I mean, my guess is that North Americans tend to want to depersonalize God out of one of two reasons. Um, one thing is that we talk more about our unfortunate experiences with other persons and with our own person, and so I think there are some of our fellow citizens who really believe that personhood isn't a very important concept or isn't a very helpful concept, that there's got to be more. But I think on the other hand, um, if, I were, if I were trying to break in someplace, I think I'd rather deal with an alarm system than with uh, a, a really effective guard that I knew how to, that I knew knew how to patrol. Uh, there, it may be that deep down we think we can trump a system, uh, an impersonal force. 
um, a person's a little more threatening. But I, there, there are probably many other explanations too. We just have to listen. Yes, sir. I was trying to cut that off at the end, but it was too short. Uh, but no, I think, uh, I think the example of Melanchthon with Luther's full support, and actually Luther's use of, of uh, rhetoric and dialectic, gives us one little piece of evidence to say nonsense, as well as a good deal of his creation theology. But no, I think we should be, um, well, you can't be a lazy Lutheran. You can't drift off into into that kind of mystical excuse for not really doing the hard, sweaty work that you've done, for instance, in trying to figure out um, how to use all of God's created gifts in the service of, of both the gospel and social justice and, and, and this realm. So it's appropriate in a, in, in a Lutheran curriculum to spend a good deal of time in conversation with those other intellectual disciplines. Yep. And we, we fail to do so at our own peril. Because, as you say, pardon? For good Lutheran reasons, yeah. Again, it's one of those things that you don't read about in your first uh, Luther textbook, but Luther is very high on the gift of reason, properly used, and, um, and the possibilities for using all the created gifts that God has given us in our time, just fabulous. Thank you for, for reminding us of that. We are at the, the 12 o'clock hour. I want to uh, express my appreciation to, to all of you, and especially to the committee. Um, uh, Mary's coming forward here. Um, thank you, Gracia, and, and, and thanks to your committee, and thanks to the whole community. Uh, this was a kind of homecoming for me, and it's been just a precious gift. Thank you.